how do you look back on your entire time with the Cleveland Browns? I look at it this way. I, I was lucky enough to have them select me in the supplemental draft. Um, couldn't have come to a better place. If you go back and look, you'll see I, I played most of the game. I got this big red streak running down the front of my, right. my jersey where I had knocked some teeth out and I couldn't take my mouthpiece out. So the, the team didn't like, keep it in, don't take it out. Welcome to Club 46, driven by Bridgestone. I'm Jay Crawford. And today we're joined by former great running back of the Cleveland Browns, Kevin Mack. Kevin, great to see you again. Thanks for taking some time with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. The first thing that comes to mind when I see you is, how do you still look this good? <laughs> you look like you could suit up and go out there and play. Uh, trust me, I just look like it. Um, actually, I've, I'm a little undersized <laughs> from my playing days. Sure. Uh, I'm about 207 now. And you played uh, at? I played at like 230, 235. That's what I thought. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and minus the monstrous pads. Right, exactly. You, almost look, you don't look like the same guy. The smile, though, gives you away. Uh, well, thank you. Hey. Um, I want to start by asking, how is life for Kevin Mack? What, what are your days like? How do you spend your time? Uh, as a matter of fact, I actually uh, work for the Cleveland Browns right. <laughs> uh, in the alumni relations department. It, it's a great job. Um, uh, for me, fortunately, I, I get to see a lot of guys that I played with, uh, meet a lot of the, uh, the the older guys who were who were before me, um, and also some of the younger guys who are, who are coming into the league now, and uh, just getting to know those guys, uh, being exposed to. To me, the biggest thing is being exposed to the older guys. They're they're yeah. just incredible. You, know, you hear some of their stories and some of the things they went through. Uh, it, it's just. Unbelievable. You're a great person to talk to about this then because you're around today's NFL and you know so well the NFL of the 80s and the 90s. In your view, what's what's been the biggest difference between today's football and when you played? It's probably the change in uh, how the game is being taught uh, at this level. Uh, how so? For for the group of guys that I played with, it was more of like a, a gladiator mentality. It, it, you know, you had to be tough, um, rough. You, you didn't back down. Uh, these guys are are being taught, you know, more smarter techniques, save your body, things yeah. like that. Uh, and like I say, we we were we were taught to just beat each other up. You know, it was, it was more physical for sure. Definitely physical, and you know, usually at the end of the season, it was. Who could stay the healthiest? Usually, it was the teams that ended up, you know, being on top and, and playing in the playoffs. Sometimes it takes a while for guys post playing days to settle into their career, to settle into what it is they're going to do for the rest of their lives. What was the transition like for you immediately after leaving football? Because we hear so many guys struggle with that transition of going from NFL player to former NFL player. These days, guys have a little bit of a learning curve that you have a lot more tools and things available to the them. league gets involved and helps yes exactly probably not so much when you were uh, out. not so much when I was there. <laughs> uh, you know we were still kind of feeling our way you know once we left the game sure um, I for me actually I I, um, I moved away from Cleveland uh, lived in Houston for 14 years uh, and during my my time there I actually did some coaching at Texas Southern University right. um, actually helped a buddy of mine get a business started uh, and I saw an opportunity for me to to be able to uh, come back here yeah. uh, with uh, the former GM, uh, Phil Savage. Right. Uh, he gave me an interview, and I was lucky enough to get my foot back in the door, which really helped me out. Let's go back to the very beginning, when when you first discovered the game of football. How did you discover football? Who introduced you to it? Who were your influences? I actually first started playing football. Uh, Pop Warner, so uh, 11, 12 in that age range. Yeah. Uh, I played about two or three years of Pop Warner. Um, I had a really great coach back then. Uh, he actually taught me uh, to have fun playing the game, mm. uh, which was, for me back then, it was, it was easy because um, I came from a little small town. Um, 
and not can outrun anybody on the field. <laughs> <laughs> What's not to have fun uh, right, about that? Right, right. So, uh, so did you know it, early, I'm, I'm good at this? No, actually because uh, after playing Pop Warner, I didn't play again until I was a junior in high school. Really? How did that happen? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I kind of got Did you play other sports? From junior high all the way through high school, I, I ran track. Yeah. How did you make your way back to football? Um, because of your success on the track? Uh, yeah, uh, and then uh, we had a new head coach to come to our high school. He was looking for guys to come out and play. Um, I wasn't sure in between him and my sister, you know, talking me up. Little did I know that. She was talking you up to coach? To, to, yeah, to, uh, to get back in and play. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't know she had some communication with his coach and his wife. and, and they, so had they were some, teaming up. Right, right. So it was like, okay. Uh, my sister thinks I'm good. I should, you know. So your sister and this new coach changed your life, essentially. Pretty much, yeah. 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 Uh, I decided, decided to go back and, uh, and play um, as a junior. Uh, did okay. You know, and I think, you know, deep down I was, wasn't really committed to the football part of it. Uh, I always had the track in mind. I didn't want to get hurt and you know, right, all sure. this stuff just so I could continue running. Uh, and then my senior year, it just kind of went crazy. <laughs> yeah. We, and uh, now you're on the map of national programs. Uh, so you end up at Clemson. At Clemson. What's the story behind that? Why Clemson? For me, they were smart enough to be one of the first, probably the first big school to, to recruit me. So it was loyalty. Yes. Got there, fell in love with the place, uh, the people I met. Um, there were a ton of guys who were from North Carolina that ended up going to Clemson down in South Carolina. Yeah. So. Uh, we had a lot of good talent to come there, and I just kind of knew we were going to be good, you know. You guys had a ton of success, but there was also some heartbreak there. Yeah. Talk about your time in Clemson, both individually and collectively as a team. The first year, probably, you know, for me, that was that hard, my hardest year. Um, as a team, we went six and five, and I was started questioning, okay. <laughs> Did I make the right decision? <laughs> Did I come to the right place? Um, but we went into our off-season program. Uh, we all worked hard as a team. Uh, our coaches, you know, they vowed to, to, to put us in the right positions and, and make sure we would be a better team the next year. Um, we knew we had talent. Um, I think we were just still all trying to grow into it. And my sophomore year, we just exploded. And, Everybody looked at us like, who are these guys? Were you surprised by your success? Uh, as a team, yes. You I won the I national was. championship. Yeah, we won the national championship, but I think our whole team at, at some point during the year was looking at each other like, oh, are we really this good? Wow. I mean, we were undefeated. Um, it, it was just unbelievable. And we beat probably one of the biggest programs in the country that year to win a national championship. Uh, which was Nebraska, and people just couldn't believe it. It was stunning. Yeah, they couldn't believe it. You finish at Clemson, had a terrific career individually, great team success. You came out at a time that was really interesting for professional football because you had the USFL, mm. which was the upstart competitor league, throwing huge contracts at players. One of them was Steve Young, yep. who signs like a 10-year, $40 what do you million mean about contract. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he goes to the LA Express. And that's where you end up, out of Clemson. What was that time in your life like? Um, it was it was a little crazy. It was a little unreal for me to think that somebody was actually paying me to play football, especially the amount of money that the LA Express was throwing around. Is that what drew you to the USFL over the NFL? Well, I think probably the biggest thing that drew me to the to the USFL was that. The fact that I hadn't didn't have to go through the draft, mm -hmm. um, I was being given a great contract, just as comparable to the NFL, what they were passing out. Um, I had a couple of guys who uh, I had one other guy who uh, was from Clemson, also on the team. We yeah. ended up being roommates. So familiarity helped. Uh, yeah, so that helped, um, and. Probably the fact that I was going to be playing in Los Angeles, you know. Yeah, that doesn't hurt. I, I'd never been on that coast. What was it like playing with Steve Young? Uh, it was great. Probably one of the smartest guys I'd ever met. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
He knew what everybody was doing, where everybody was supposed to be. Um, great talent. It, it was just unbelievable how he, he, he was uncanny about how he knew stuff. Yeah. Especially that time we were all coming out of college. Sure. You know, young guys. And it's like, okay, all right. Well, he, he knows what he's doing, you know, so we got to pick it up. You know? yeah. The league made a splash, and there were some that thought that they could make a serious run at giving the NFL all the competition they could handle. But you said throwing money around. Yeah. There was a lot of that, and the league burned out quickly. And so the next year, you end up being drafted, I believe, in the supplemental draft. Supplemental draft, yeah. You come to the Cleveland Browns. What's going through your mind now knowing that, A, I'm going to wear orange again, but B, I'm going to a new league and a new team all over again for the second straight year? Yeah, you know, that transition was a little, it was a little iffy, it was a little crazy for me because uh, I guess some deals were being made behind the scenes. People really, really didn't know about it. At the time, my agent really didn't tell me a lot about it because I was actually getting ready to prepare and go into training camp for the second season right. with L.A. Um, and then all of a sudden he calls me and tells me, hey, you've been released, go home, I'll call you in a couple of hours. Uh, and what did you think? I was like, I, I was just kind of shocked. I was like, okay, I've been cut, I've been, what's going on? Yeah. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, he called me and told me, he's like, hey, go ahead and pack, uh, you're going to Cleveland. And I was like, Cleveland? He's <laughs> like, what's going on? He's like, Cleveland's going to sign you to a contract. And I was like, wow, okay. Uh, had never been to Cleveland before. <laughs> uh, it was February. I, so it's safe to say you weren't thrilled initially to know that you're leaving LA, uh, going to a place that's cold and you don't uh, really know. Right, right. So uh, I get here from LA wearing a members only jacket. I don't know if you remember those oh, things. So, classic. Jacket. And it's freezing. And I'm like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? <laughs> LA attire doesn't work here in February. No, no, no. Met with. Um, um, Mr. Corsi, Ernie Accorsi, uh Marty, all the coaches, uh, and immediately uh, kind of felt at ease, you know, um, thinking, okay, I think I found a pretty good organization here yeah. and that, that wants me. How long did it get to get you to that point where you, where you realized this isn't a negative, this is a good thing? You know, the, that first year after coming in and, and just going through workouts and, and, and mini camps and stuff like that, wasn't really sure. Um, I think Marty probably was the biggest, biggest uh, factor in there. You know, he's telling me the whole time that you're better than 90% of the guys on the field. Relax. Because you know, wow. he, he knew I was nervous. He's like, just relax, play the game. And he's like, you're better than 90% 90 of the people here. What was the moment for you where you said, oh, I'm, I can do this and be very good at this level here? It was it in a game? Probably was doing a game. Um, as everyone know, me and Ernest Barney got to be really, really close. Um, you know, we, we would frustrate the coaches at times because we would we knew each other's place, so we would switch positions <laughs> mid game. Right. <laughs> you know, sometimes he was like, "Okay, you run this one, uh, and I'll block," and I would do the same. And wow. then we get to the sideline, and they'd be like, "What are you guys doing?" And he's like, it's "Like, just relax. We know what we're doing," and, and it would work perfectly. Oh, it worked. Uh, it was just being with him, the challenge he kind of laid down. He's like, hey, you know, this is doing training camp. He's like, we're going to be the two starting running backs for this team. He's Ernest like, said to you. Yeah, yeah. He's like, so let's go out and work. And we did. I mean, training camp, it, I mean, off-season workouts. Uh, you usually saw us together working out together, pushing each other. Yeah. So he was, your, he was your wingman. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you come into the league with some uncertainty, and you immediately, with Ernest, make history. In the history of the league, only twice prior and only three times since has the same team had a tandem of running backs go over a thousand yards in the same season. Take us back to that time. Were you even aware of what you guys were doing? No. You know, we, we were just having fun. We had challenged each other. Each other. Um, Was there a competition? I'm running for more yards. I'm going to lead the team in rushing. No, we really didn't look at it that way. Yeah. I mean, it, we looked at it as as long as we win as a team, we didn't care who who got the most yards. Right. It, we just loved pushing each other. It was, it was like a competition yeah. between the two of us. It's like, okay, you you had a big run. It's my turn. Yeah. So we would go back and forth like that. Um, now I don't think we the neither one of us really had a grasp on 
what we had accomplished. Yeah. Uh, especially considering he got his yards on the last play of the game, uh, the last game of the regular season. To go over 1,000. Right. Yeah. So uh, I think that probably made it more special for us that he accomplished it with the last play, uh, the last game of the season. One of the most memorable games in franchise history, and that's the 86 first round playoff game against the Jets. Take us back to that moment. One of the first plays of the game, <clears throat> we had a bad quarterback center exchange. Weather on the shores of Lake Erie. Second down now and seven for the Browns. Bumble ball. I jumped on the ball, and about four or five guys jumped on the on my back, in the back of my helmet. So my chin strap broke, my face mask came up. Um, if you go back and look, you'll see I, I played most of the game. I got this big red streak running down the front of my, my jersey where I had knocked some teeth out, and I couldn't take my mouthpiece out. So the, the team dentist like, keep it in, don't take it out, whatever you do. Uh, ended up in the dentist's office after that game. <laughs> really? Yeah. You talk about the teeth being out of your head but still in your mouthpiece. Like, that's, like, everyday fair. Did you know right away that you'd lost the teeth? I, I did not know right away. Uh, I, I, and this is, you know, I'm standing in the huddle. My teammate, Mike Babb, looks at me. He's like, he's like, geez, K-Mac, your mouth looks like hamburger. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm like, gee, thanks, man. <laughs> uh, so the, I'm bleeding. So the trainers that told you what, what happened? Yeah, because they, they're looking at, first they're looking at my lip and how chewed up it was. Uh, so I open and I get ready to take my mouthpiece out. And as I'm pulling my mouthpiece, I could feel my teeth coming too. And they was like, nope, push it back. So I pushed it back. That's like, you can't take it out for Played the rest of the game with the, the mouthpiece. <laughs> Standing on the sideline with the mouthpiece. Right, right, right. So, and what happens after the game when you finally so take after, it out? After the game, uh, you know, get showered, cleaned up. Shower with the mouthpiece? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I end up uh, having to go to our, our team dentist's office and, and doing some more surgery and stuff to get my, my teeth back. <laughs> <laughs> the Jets still without a turnover. Raymond McNeil breaks it and he's going in. Freeman McNeil crosses the goal line, breaks the plane, and the Jets, the underdog, take a 19-10 lead. 80,000 here at Cleveland Stadium stunned as the Jets look to put up a 20th point. And the Browns need two scores just to tie the game. They need a touchdown and a field goal to tie the game with just 4.14 to play. People are leaving the stadium, Kevin. What's going through your mind as you're watching half the stadium go home? Uh, well, as, I guess as all the people are leaving, I'm thinking, okay, this is not a good sign, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knew we hadn't played well as an offense all, all, all game long. Uh, we were starting to pick it up a little bit and uh, get ourselves some points on the board. Uh, I knew as a as a as a player on that offense that none of us had quit. Yeah. As long as there was enough time on the clock, we knew we had a chance. So once we got um, close enough, I always thought that our defense was going to play well enough to get us the ball back. Um, you know, even you know, even when we were down, I don't think anybody on our team ever really thought that fans we were had given us. up, but you guys had. Yeah, we yeah. You're down ten, three ish to go. And Bernie is picking apart that Jets defense, which had been very good up to that point. Mm -hmm. The two-minute warning happens. You come into the game, and you score on the next play. What's going through your mind as you bust through that line for that one-yard touchdown? Kevin Mack might be slanting to the right side, the left side of the Jet defense. Kevin Mack is in standing up. Late blocker. Was Everett, 157 to play, the extra point coming up. And now it's a three-point game, under two minutes to play. Um, as, I, as, I, as, as, as we're scoring, I'm thinking, we need to score this quick, you know. Get in the end zone quick, stop to get the clock stopped, so our defense can get back on the field and give us the ball back. That's, that's my mind. A lot of people are thinking, you know, these guys are not going to come back. Right. But, 
you know, as a player, that's what you're taught, and that's what you think, and that's what you do. They're going for the field goal on this down. 11 seconds left. Marty says, we're kicking now to tie it and try to get it to overtime. Mark Mosley had missed two. And he was, you know, one of the last throwback straight on kickers. What's going through your mind as he's coming out there to kick a field goal to tie this thing after being down 10 with three minutes to go? You know, it, it, it was kind of like, you know, hey, it's in Mark's hands now. We put our trust in a guy who had just gotten signed, uh, hoping he could extend our playoff. Was that the most fun you ever had in a Browns uniform? Probably one of the, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't remember us playing any more double overtime games. Um, and after thinking about it, how hard we fought back as a team and how we ended up winning in double overtime, we didn't quit. Uh, Gave us an opportunity to move on to the playoffs. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Now you get the Denver Broncos. What was that week like, that build up to the AFC Championship game here in Cleveland? Uh, it was crazy. <laughs> it's always <laughs> crazy. Uh, <clears throat> Could you go anywhere without people wanting to talk about what's no, going no, to happen? No, you couldn't. Sunday? And, and, and I think for most of us, once we had you know, got past a few steps in the playoffs. We, we, we didn't completely stop going out, but we, we kind of knew that we would have to pull ourselves away back from being out in the public so much because the people here in Cleveland were just so excited about the team being there. They had faith that we were going to win. Uh, and they just wanted to have a good time with us. And we were like, okay, you know, yeah. we got to win the game first. So we, we kind of pulled back from being really visible and being out a lot. Sure. Uh, at least I know I did. I don't know about the rest of my te teammates, yeah. but I've heard a lot of them say they did. Um, it, it's, it's unbelievable how uh, the fans here are so excited about their teams and, and when their success happens for them. Uh, it's just an unbelievable feeling. Unbelievable yeah. how much pride they show in, in the sports teams here in Cleveland. It really becomes the biggest thing in their lives. Yeah. But I want to take you back to that Broncos game where it appears that you're inside of two minutes of going to a Super Bowl. Yeah. And now you're helpless, like everybody in the stadium, except for the 11 guys that are on that field playing defense. How are you watching the drive? What's going through your mind as Elway is completing one play after another? Uh, this can't be happening. <laughs> That's going through my mind. Uh, it, it means I'm standing on the sideline looking, and I'm thinking, okay, I got 98 yards to go. It's not going to happen against our defense. But it does. It, was there a point in the drive where you felt like the Jets, when you guys were doing the same thing to them? Because essentially... That's what happened. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think of it that way after all these years. Uh, no, I never really thought. I just kept thinking, you know, our defense is better than this. You know, they can, they can stop these guys. They're not going to let them go 98 yards, especially 98 yards in less than two minutes. Right. You know, it's kind of hard to describe. It's hard to explain. But, you know, it happened. It, it, it happened. Um, I don't know how it happened, but it right. did. How long did it take, Kevin, for you to be, and I don't know that you'll ever perfectly be at peace with what happened, but at some point, you have to let it go and move on. Where was that point for you? When did you say, I'm done with the playoff loss to the Broncos the first time? When, when was that out of your mind? Uh, I don't know. Probably, you know, for me, it probably didn't start until we had gone through our off-season workouts and we're ready to start the next season. You know, probably going- You were in, done with it then? Yeah, probably going into training camp was like, okay, it's a new year, new season, all this in the past. Let's, Let's move exercise forward. those demons and be on with it. Yeah. So you fast forward the end of that season and now you got to go to their place. Right. And it's as difficult to win there on the road in the postseason as it is to win in Cleveland on the road in the postseason. And late in the game, they're up a touchdown, and you had had a tremendous game. Ernest had had one of 
the most productive games of his career, and that's saying something. Yes. But between running the ball and catching the ball, you guys were basically in position t- to tie the game late because of Ernest's play. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. You know, it's something that I, I've, I've said to people, you know, over the years many times. It's like they'd like to blame him for us losing. I was like, no. I, Go back and look at the game. I was like, you can blame him for us still being in the game. Um, if he had scored, we wouldn't be leading. We'd be tied. Sure. Uh, With about a minute and change to go. Right, right. So. And it would be I, almost, okay, here we yeah, are again. Yeah, so I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying that, you know, a lot of things that people say, you know, try to point out is like. There, there still would have been a lot of football to, to happen. Exactly. Um, I'm on the sideline watching. Um, we had a uh, had a one back offense on the field, and I knew what the play was coming because I'm standing by the side. The coach is calling the play, and um, I look at the guy. I was like, "Coach, I was like, I need to be in there. You might want to look." I was like, "He's a little tired. He's been, you know, look at him. He's bent over in the huddle. It's like I know he's pushing himself. It's like, oh, he's fine." I was like, "Okay, the play is run. I, I watched Bernie hand off to him." You know, he makes a couple of moves and he's moving to the outside and it looks like he scores. And then all of a sudden you see this scrum of people, you know, moving around and I'm going, no, 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 no. Because when you see people moving and jumping and stuff like that, you know the ball's on. The quick change of direction is a dead giveaway. Yeah. Um, and all I could do was just look at him and, and, and see how devastated he was. I uh, wasn't really moving. He was kind of laying on the field. Uh, what did you say to him when you got to him? Hey, I just told him, hey, man, it's all right. You know, you played your heart out. So, it's no shame. You know, nobody can blame you. It's like if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the position we are right now. Um, and how was he taking it? I mean, I, I know everybody told him that. Yeah. At that, did, did, at, did he listen? To yeah, that? at that time, he wasn't listening. He wasn't. At that time, he, he, I don't think he could hear very much. You know, I don't think most people could, uh, knowing that, you know, you just fumbled away, you know, a score. Um, or just fumbling away the ball, period, uh, to the opposing team. Do you talk to that play about about that play with Ernest today? Have you have you had conversations with him, or I don't bring you it let up. that sleeping dog yeah, lie? I don't bring it up. I mean, yeah. what's the point? There's no good in it. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, you're not solving any problems by bringing it up and talking about it. Uh, at least, you know, from my perspective. Yeah. Have you had moments where you wished it had been you? Carrying that ball? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do wish. Yeah, hey, give me the opportunity. But you never know what's going to happen, though. How long did it take for you to get that loss out of your psyche? I think that one stuck with us a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a training camp? Uh, no, yet. no. <laughs> uh, I think it probably during the season somewhere when we, when we thought we were going to make the playoffs again, and we go, uh, they just hope we don't have to play Denver again, you know? What did you learn about the fans of the Cleveland Browns during that time? That they love their team. <laughs> they love their team. Yeah. Um, you know, just being here in Cleveland uh, for as many years as I have, it's just been unbelievable to hear the stories from, from people who, who were here back in the 40s, 50s, talk about the team, how much they love the team, mm-hmm. uh, how many years they've had season tickets, uh, is, is really incredible. Um, if, if you're not from Cleveland, you've never been here, and you come here and you see a Browns game and you see how fanatical the, the fans are, then you realize this is a, this is a city who, who loves the team. Um, you know, perfect example is when the team moved in 99. Um, it, it was kind of heartbreaking for me. I was living in Houston at the time just mm-hmm. to see that happen and, and see the tears and how much pain that the, the people of Cleveland was Unimaginable. Was it was. It really was. A handful of years earlier. Yeah. It's like, uh, wow. I, I couldn't believe it. It never crossed my mind as a, as a former player that uh, the Cleveland Browns would ever leave the city of Cleveland. Right. And it happened. And then it, it, was just, it was just heart-wrenching. And they come back, and there's been many lean years, and the fans keep, they keep coming, coming back. They keep coming. Yeah. What does that say? Uh, that, that shows you how great a fan base you have here, mm-hmm. how much they really love their team, 
and it's not just you know coming to the stadium to to watch a football game. You know, they, they're coming to bond with their team, yeah. and many of them do. Kev, you really can't talk about those '80s Browns teams without thinking of Dog Pound. <laughs> what, how, how did all of that come to be? Uh, well. I, like most people know, you know, Hanford Dixon and Frank Minifield, those two guys, they came up with that name. Um, you know, during the course of the, the years as it, it came about, those two guys would always come down to this end zone. They, they get the fans going down here in this, this part of the end zone, uh, especially when the visiting team was, was down here. <laughs> So somehow it came about, these guys started throwing dog biscuits and all kind of stuff on the field during the, during the game. So these two guys started calling them the dog pal. Uh, and it stuck. Who know, Who would have thought that it would have stuck? It stuck, uh, Kevin, in part because it was such a perfect description. Dog pound. <laughs> Th these fans were rabid. And it was almost like they were caged all week long and then for those three hours on Sunday, they got to come here and let it all out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, it was, it was pretty intimidating, even for, uh, for me as a home player, you know, to look over here and see these guys chewing on dog biscuits <laughs> and all kind of stuff, and, and throwing stuff at the visiting team. Uh, it was pretty unique to be able to come this way and see how excited guys were, you know, from my vantage point being in the backfield, I'm looking over the top of everybody. Right You're seeing into it. it right into I'm seeing it all, yeah, yeah. What uh, was it like to score a touchdown in that end of the field? Oh, it was great. It was unbelievable. Um, you'd have to be careful because if you got too close, they would suck you in. They would just pull you right in, <laughs> with, you know, into the celebration. Uh, but to see them celebrate like they did with a touchdown in this end zone was, was just great. It's rare that that bridge is reciprocal. The, the fans always pour their love to the players. It's, it's not often in professional sports that you see the players pouring it right back at the fans. Is that what makes the Cleveland Browns organization different? It's, it's that connection between fans and franchise and it goes both ways. I, I, I really do, I really do. And it, it's, I mean, the whole time I was here as a player, even to this day, uh, it, it's kind of always been like that, where you know you, you give back to the city and to the fans who come out and support this team. You're in this building a lot, so I imagine you're not always reflecting back. But but as you stand here on the the wall separating fans from field, can you almost hear the the roar of the old municipal stadium crowd if you try? I, I, there's moments, yeah, yeah. There's there's plenty of moments, um, especially when the fans get going in here. Uh, depending on, depending on where I'm at on game day, sometimes I'm I'm passing in between the levels, and I can hear that thunder, and get a little goof goosebumps, a little chills, and go, okay, that that sounded like uh, back in the day when we were playing, you know. And you, you can compare a little bit and and, and see the comparisons of, of how things are similar. Even though it's a little bit smaller, uh, to me, it, it, it's the same spot. You know, the field runs the same way. Um, it's just a little bit more modern, and uh, the fans are still waiting on that that little taste of something that we used to give the guy. That give big the win. Team. Yeah. You've had plenty of opportunities, Kevin, through the years to hear the fans tell you how much you've meant to them. I'd like to give you an opportunity to look into the camera now and have you tell the fans what they've meant to you and what you feel about all the support that they've given, not just you and your teams, but this organization throughout the years. You know, I, I just think it's uh, amazing how um, the city, uh, the fans of the Browns have, uh, no matter what, no matter what the circumstances, what the conditions are. They've supported this organization, um, the teams that's, that's passed uh, through here uh, with open arms, 100%. Uh, they're here cheering no matter what the record is for the team. For them to be able to do that, no conditions, is just truly amazing. It, it really is amazing. Uh, it 
shows me that the Browns fans in this city really love this team unconditionally. Um, it, it's just amazing, you know, the number of times they show up, like I said, no matter what the record is, uh, they just love their Browns. And yeah, they do. We love them, you know, whether they believe it or not or, or recognize it or not. Uh, as a former player, it, we're, we're connected and we love our fans just as much as they love their team. When you played in Cleveland, you guys were the people that if we had run into you, we would tell that story for weeks. Where were you guys hiding? Where, <laughs> when, when you guys would get together socially and go do your thing, where were you? Where, where were the places that you would stop by in Cleveland? Um, you know, a few guys had a few different spots. I mean, different spots. Uh, probably the biggest place that most people knew we hang out, uh, hung out at was um, the flats. Quite a few of us hung out at the flats. I remember. Um, totally different. People, I mean, people here in Cleveland today, they talk about the flats. Not the same. No. <laughs> it's not the same. Um, and I guess the good thing about, about it for us was that we hung out as a team. You know, you never, you, you rarely saw one of one or two of us together, uh, there uh, by themselves. It was always a group of guys. You yeah. know, it was about five or six of us together. Um, I think our biggest spot that we hung out, and this probably is going to weird some people out, that probably the biggest spot we hung out together, probably did our most team bonding, uh, was Great Northern Mall. Really? There was uh, a. Fridays at Great Northern Mall. Okay. So after our hard practices during the week, we would all, I mean, you probably have half the team in the place. Uh, you know, having a beer, you know. The manager had around. to give you guys your special corner, right? <laughs> no, we, we were just kind of all over the place. It was, it was crazy. Um, but it was, it was funny. It was a standing rule that the last guy there had to pay the tab. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you'd want to hit and get. So right, 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 <laughs> right. It happened to me once. I'm like, oh, this is not going to happen again. When you look back on your, on your career, all as a Cleveland Brown, nine seasons, over 5,000 yards, I think I looked up 99 games and like 46 touchdowns. That's, that's a pretty good ratio. How do you look back on your entire time with the Cleveland Browns? Because you, your role did change here. But... You were always a big player in this offense. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I look at it this way. I, I was lucky enough to have them select me in the supplemental draft. Um, couldn't have come to a better place. Uh, the people, uh, not just the fans, but the people that I've, I've, I've gotten to know and, and uh, gone out to dinner with. and. and, and at a personal level, I've gotten to know a lot of people here in the city. Um, it reminds me a lot of home. So yeah. uh, it, it fits me. Uh, I know you're not from here, but you consider yourself a Clevelander now? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, after nine years as a player and being back for 12, working in the front office, yeah, I think yeah. 21 years qualify me. It's official, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's official for sure. Yeah. I want to take you to this, this current carnation of the Browns. There are some similarities to this group, to the group that you were with early in your career. Yeah. Do, do, do you see any similarities at all between your Browns as they were on the brink of exploding to this team? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, young team, lots of talent. You know, for, for us, it was about us going out and finding you know, what kind of team we were. Um, we started out as a running team. We developed into a, um, a passing team that could run. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, it's, it's exciting because I've had a ton of phone calls from Browns alumni wanting tickets, wanting to know when they can come to a game. Um, they see the similarities, and now they want to see them perform. It, it's exciting for, for former players because we know they're – they're on the brink. They're, they're, they have the tools. It's just all about how they're going to come together in training camp and, and perform on, uh, on Sundays. During what's the what's their ceiling, do you think, this year? I don't know. I mean, I, I think they have a chance to be 
really, really good this year. A lot better than most people think. Um, and, and there are expectations, so that's saying something. Yeah. Uh, I, don't like to, I don't like to make predictions and put pressure on sure, people. Right. Uh, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if we were in the playoffs this year. Wow. Yeah. What's your take on Baker? Uh, I like him. He's cocky. He, he's got a lot of energy. Is that a good thing? Uh, I think so. Um, I haven't seen him, uh, you know, use it in a negative way. You know, so you want your quarterback to be out there and be have, you know, some confidence. Sure. Um, a lot of people don't realize Bernie was a really confident guy. He, he, you know, he didn't display it the way Baker does. Yeah. Uh, but very confident. Knew what he was doing. Knew what everybody else around him was doing. Um, Sometimes he he would change things up, and you know you go, okay, what made you do that? That it would be perfect, it'd be great. So, I, I think you know we might be seeing a little bit of that return of that in Baker. So uh, that could be good. Could be very. How about good. the running backs? Uh, really excited about the running backs. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> uh, you know, I always, I always like to look at those guys, see how they are. Sure. Uh, it was a little bit scary though. Uh, spoken to Nick a couple times and it's like, dude, just reminds me of me too much when I was really guy. just quiet guy gets his work done strong can run uh, it's, a little, it's, a, it's a little weird <laughs> it's like okay there are similarities that, that there really are yeah, he, um, his his skill set is very similar oh, to yours. Uh, first few times I saw him run I was like oh my god hey, and, and, he breaks through the line and it's like, I was like, somebody better catch this guy. He's gone. <laughs> uh, We're and, hoping no one does. <laughs> right, right, right. Give us that clutch performance, run he, to the end zone. He's just a real, real nice guy. Uh, and it was kind of weird. The first couple times I've met him, it, you know, he doesn't say much, I doesn't say much. So yeah. It's like, okay, who's going to start this conversation here? <laughs> Kevin, I want to say thank you very much for joining us on Club 46, driven by Bridgestone. It's great to catch up with you. You look great. I know you're having fun with the Browns now. Continued success to you. Ah, thank you, James.